Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, a comprehensive toxicology screening solution targeted to individual needs. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. This presentation has been approved for continuing education credits. If you want to obtain the credits, please click on the Get Your Free CE Credits button located in the lower left of your screen. This will take you to a page listing all of the, our speakers and presentations. Please select the CE button under the presentation and follow the instructions to claim your certificate. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Ping Wong, PhD. Dr. Ping Wong is the Medical Director of Clinical Chemistry at Houston Methodist Hospital and Associate Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. She is board certified in clinical chemistry, molecular diagnostics, and toxicological chemistry by the American Board of Clinical Chemistry, for which she currently serves as Vice President and Chair of the Examination Committee. Dr. Wong is a Fellow of the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry. She currently serves or has served on the boards of NACA, AACC LBDD Division, and TDM and Toxicology Division. Dr. Wong has received many honors and awards, including the Career Cornerstone Award, NACB Distinguished Abstract Award, and the AACC Outstanding Research Award. She has published over 60 peer-reviewed papers, abstracts, and book chapters. Dr. Wong has over 10 years of experience directing and managing high complexity CLIA clinical laboratories and is an expert in CLIA regulations, laboratory management to drive clinical efficiency, quality and outcome, clinical assay development, optimization and execution in a highly regulated environment. Dr. Wong's current research interests focus on translating novel research and startup findings into clinical diagnostic tools. She is principal investigator of two NIH grants and actively collaborates with major diagnostic companies as well as startup ventures to develop next generation diagnostic tools. I will now turn it over to Dr. Wong for her presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Judy, for the nice introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a comprehensive toxicology screening solution targeted to individual needs. So first of all, a little bit overview of what I will be talking about today. I will touch uh, upon a little bit on the background of clinical toxicology screening and talk about the current approaches we use in clinical toxicology screening. And then um, I will lead that to limitations of the current approach. And then to illustrate that better, I will talk about two different cases, which are real cases happening uh, in our institution, and then give you the flavor of uh, what I mean by limitations of the current approaches. And then after that, uh, we want to address the limitations and introduce our new solution for this toxicology uh, screening approach. So to do that, to engage our clinical providers, we pushed out a survey to the clinical providers here in the institution. So I will talk a little bit about, uh, about the survey, what the survey contains, uh, and then I will review the results of the survey briefly. <clears throat> And then after that, I will go a little bit in depth into the analytical approach we use to address the clinical needs and what we have developed as the final solution to uh, the toxicology screening approach here. 
So uh, first of all, a little bit of background on clinical toxicology screening. So most of us who are in the field of clinical toxicology probably know that the urine drugs of abuse testing is probably the most frequently used tool in clinical toxicology screening. Uh, most of the hospital labs as well as reference labs will get a lot of orders for the urine drugs of abuse. Many of them may come from the ER, for example, the emergency room, and some of them may come from other places. So depending on where you are, which lab you are in, and which platform you use, these urine drugs of abuse testing typically contain about seven to nine drugs, and they're usually immunoassays to uh, uh, adapt to the needs of quick turnaround time. And they're usually not multiplexed, so you have to run different assays to get the answers for different drugs uh, in order to report them to your ordering physicians, uh, with the exception that sometimes point-of-care devices can give you a cartridge with uh, se several different drugs can be incorporated on the same cartridge, and you may be able to get answers from the same cartridge. So again, depending on the platform and vendor use, uh, this may contain fencycladine, benzodiazepines, cocaine, amphetamines, THC, uh, opiates, barbiturates, tricyclic antidepressants, as well as methadone and sometimes methadone metabolites. So um, the results are usually presumptive positive. So as a matter of fact, per uh, CAP regulation, for example, if you look at the CAP checklist, there is a requirement that you have to report these results as presumptive positive. And if the clinicians want a confirmatory results, then usually they have to send that out by confirmation, which are typically done by mass spectrometry. Not every lab they have mass spectrometry. So traditionally, this would be a send out test in most hospital labs. And the turnaround time, depending on the geographic location and the reference lab you use, typically is about a week. So any kind of clinical intervention that will need quick turnaround time and quick results uh, would, not ha would not be able to be uh, administered uh, within that time frame. So I kind of touched a little bit already on the limitations of the current clinical toxicology screening approaches. But then here is a slide uh, kind of summarizing what I just talked about and a little bit more. So the limitations, first of all, uh, and this is a limited menu of seven to nine drugs, and depending on vendor and platform, and only covers what were historically considered to be frequently abused drugs. So the menu has not changed for many years. Historically, we know these were the drugs that uh, are prone to be abused a lot by the um, uh, uh, potentially the patient population. However, as we know, in the clinical toxicology and medical toxicology area, the providers know that we have new designer drugs appearing out almost every day now. So uh, with a manual that has not changed for many years, the question remains whether this is still sufficient to cover the current medical or clinical toxicology needs. I think if you talk to any medical to toxicologist, they will tell you the answer is no. Uh, the, drugs, the drugs of abuse testing uh, many we use now is not sufficient to cover many clinical needs in today's world. And then the second limitation is the low sensitivity for some of the compounds and metabolites. So one of the examples would be benzos, and I will be uh, giving you some case uh, examples, as well as talk a little bit further about the literature search and things uh, behind uh, the uh, benzo example. And then uh, the third uh, limitation is low specificity or cross-reactivity. So uh, the low sensitivity is caused by limited reactivity of the assay with the metabolites and sometimes uh, some compounds in a family of uh, drugs or medications. And the cross-reactivity to unwanted uh, compounds or things that are not included in the abused list uh, cause issues for low specificity. So these are the major current limitations of the screening approaches we use today. So to give you a little bit of flavor here, here is a, a case number one, which is a real case happening in our institution. 
So here's a patient who was admitted for inpatient psychiatric treatment, and he was prescribed lorazepam with the brand name Ativan uh, at 2 milligrams per TID for his medical condition. And the urine drug screen, or UDS, uh, has been performed repeatedly over the past year at our institution to rule out drugs of abuse and also to monitor compliance with therapy. Since March 2014, the urine drug screen has been repeatedly negative for benzodiazepines. And one note here is that all the prior UDS9 in the same institution on the same patient had always been positive for benzodiazepines. But the patient insists that he has continued to take his medication as prescribed. So uh, while the patient was admitted for his inpatient psychiatric treatment to ensure that he was taking his medication, the clinical pharmacist actually documented the administration and observed the administration of lorazepam to the patient. However, when they uh, continue to send the UDS to our lab uh, for urine drugs of abuse testing, uh, the benzo uh, result continues to be negative for uh, this particular analyte. So the clinical pharmacist at that point for the inpatient psychiatry floor was calling us for an explanation and asking whether he should trust the patient and award the lab result. So this is a typical dilemma that our providers may face and then that may be presented to us as laboratorians. So uh, in the table below the, uh, on the bottom of the slide here, you can see here are our assay results. Uh, for benzodiazepines for this, for, for this patient uh, in question. So we use Roche assays, uh, immunoassays for the benzo drugs of abuse screening. And repeatedly, as I mentioned before, the benzo result has been negative. So to troubleshoot this, to investigate in this case, we send the patient sample to another site, which is a community a hospital in our health system, uh, who used triage testing platform for drugs of abuse screening. So the result came back as positive for benzodiazepines. And we also send out the same sample to a send out reference lab for GC mass spec confirmation. So the, again, the result came back as reporting a high concentration of lorazepam glucuronide. So this is a typical case uh, illustrating the limitations of our urine drugs abuse screening today. So upon investigation, uh, we noted we, uh, as a lab, switched from uh, triage assay to the roche kims assay for UDS in 2014. So the KIMS assay stand for Kinetic Interaction of Microparticles in Solution. This was an immunoassay assay on Roche automation platform. And then we noted that the uh, Roche assay has a very low cross-reactivity for lorazepam glucuronide. So if you look at the package insert, it is known that the cross-reactivity for lorazepam glucuronide, which is a major metabolite of lorazepam, is only 1.1%. So let's say if you use a 300 nanograms per mil as a cuddle for benzodiazepine, for example, using a typical compound in the benzo uh, class, which is nordiazepam at 300 nanograms per mil as a cutoff, then you have to have higher than two, uh, 20,000 nanograms per mil of lorazepam glucuronide for the assay to turn out a positive result. And that typically is not achieved in a urine sample uh, from any kind of patient who is either taking a prescription drug or it was abusing uh, this particular compound. On the other hand, the lorazepam is rapidly conjugated with glucuronic acid, which will accumulate in plasma and finally accumulate in the urine. 75% of the dose eliminated in the urine uh, would be in the form of lorazepam glucuronide, and only 14% would be as conjugates of other minor metabolites. Negligible amounts of unchanged drugs would be found in the urine. So um, as a matter of fact, if the assay was designed to target detection of lorazepam, then this is not very meaningful for urine drug abuse screening because you will find very little lorazepam glucuronide in the patient's urine. And this was not the only compound that had a very low cross-reactivity uh, with the particular immunoassay. So another example would be, for example, tomazepam glucuronide, which is another uh, metabolite for the benzo group of compounds. So the cross-reactivity to that is even lower at 0.7%. So you have to have 300,000 nanograms per mil equivalence of this metabolite for the assay to turn out a positive 
result, which uh, basically uh, was saying that you will never be able to see a positive result for a patient who was taking this medication. And this was not our, uh, our observation was not the only finding, of course, in the literature. So if you look in the literature, there are, are many uh, different um, um, reports and articles that have reported similar observations. So I just give you one example here. Uh, and this was a paper published in 2014 on pain physician. Uh, so in the table here, they actually compared the false negative rates of uh, three different immunoassays for urine drugs of abuse screening. So these include the KIMS assay, the CDA assay, and HSCD assay. And then they listed several uh, compounds in the class of benzodiazepines. Uh, upon, among them uh, would be lorazepam, glucorana, for example. And then they compared the false negative rates and the range uh, uh, and the mean concentration of the partic particular benzodiazepine uh, in these immunoassays. So as you can see, this is not a particular problem isolated just to one particular vendor or immunoassay. It's a universal problem common for many different assays and many different vendors. And this may not only be limited to one compound either, it can affect many different compounds and actually not limited to only benzodiazepines as well. So um, to illustrate more point on limitations of clinical toxicology screening approaches, we have a second case here. So case number two is a patient with reported medications admitted for opioid detox. So below, I listed the reported medications uh, on the medical record. So he was taking Xanax or with the genetic name uh, Alprazolam at 20 milligrams daily. Uh, and uh, here's what's reported on one place in his medical record. But here is the issue coming if you are relying on documentation for medical record, because depending on where you look in medical records, actually you may find conflicting uh, documentation. For example, another note in the same patient's electron electronic medical record says that he was taking various benzodiazepines, not just the l -prozolam. So the question comes, uh, exactly what he was taking and even the documented uh, medication history can be a little bit confusing and reliable at times. And then of course because he was admitted for opioid detox, he was prescribed um, uh, oxycodone at 200 milligrams per, uh, per day uh, for this treatment purpose. But again, another note in the same medical record says that he was using multiple opioids and not oxycodone specifically. So again, and this is a conflicting point, and really you are trying to rely on lab results to tell whether exactly what the patient was taking. And then he report, self-report also cannabis use, and then there was also got the painting on the medication list and quality. And uh, below in the table, you could see the uh, drugs and abuse testing result. So on the right side, you can see here's the Roche testing result, which is what we use again as immunoassay for the urine drugs of abuse screening. So as uh, consistent to his reported medications used, you can see benzo uh, being positive, consistent with his either Xanax use or multiple different benzodiazepine use. And then uh, everything else was negative uh, besides the THC, which, which was also consistent with reported medication use. However, an unexpected finding here is the oxycodone. So oxycodone result turned out to be negative. And upon repeating of uh, the same sample, uh, it still came out as negative. So here's the question, is the patient really taking his medication uh, oxycodone as part of his opiate detox uh, program agreement? So uh, from the lab result, the answer seems to be yes. But just to, um, the answer, I'm sorry, the answer seems to be no. So, uh, but just to make sure, and we wanna make sure there is no analytical false negatives here, uh, we wanna confirm the test result. But here the question comes, 
uh, if we send out to our sister hospital who was using a triage platform, they actually don't have oxycodone on their test manual here on the triage platform. So in this uh, case, this is a moot point to actually send to a neighboring institution with a triage platform because the test manual limitation on that particular platform. So this again case illustrates uh, how much importance the lab result plays in the patient management of medical toxicology as well as the limitations we have in today's tours. So um, realizing these kind of limitations then as a clinical laboratory and our next step is to try to come up with a new solution to help our clinical providers. So to achieve that, we first need to take a look at who was ordering the UDS uh, more or most and we would like to be able to address their needs. Sorry, and that's my uh, office light going out. I'll make sure it's on. Um, so to do this, we uh, did an internal audit looking at my uh, institution's UDS ordering pattern. So on the graph here, you can see the peak, the highest peak here, of course, uh, came from ER. So the emergency room was ordering lots of these urine drugs of abuse. And then there are also smaller peaks distributed across the hospital. So these include medical intensive care units, uh, and then residence teaching services, uh, psychiatric units, and neurology floor, and then uh, the internal medicine, hepatology units, for example. And then our next step is to uh, design a clinical user survey and then send the survey out to these uh, most frequent users of our UDS tests. So we send them uh, to providers in ED, oncology, neurology, critical care, pulmonary, internal medicine, critical care, gastroenterology, hepatology, and transplant. So in this survey, we basically posed the three uh, basic questions here. Uh, what was the reason for you to order the UDS uh, result, uh, testing? And then what turnaround time requirement do you have for your testing needs? And then let's say if we propose a more comprehensive toxicology testing solution with higher sensitivity specificity and with a trade-off that it may come, up, come back to you with a slightly longer turnaround time, and this time frame would be two to three days, would you be interested to use this new service when you test? So I put in the table below the, uh, some of the uh, uh, responses from the providers. So as you can see, the reasons for ordering varies uh, between different providers, and then I will reveal that and summarize that in the next slide for you. Uh, for turnaround time needed, most of them say, of course, uh, as quickly as you can. But uh, typically, they would be uh, minimal to a two to three hours, uh, two to three um, days of turnaround time for this uh, more accurate test results. And all of them express needs in using this uh, new test or new solution we propose to, the, to them. So to summarize a little bit on the clinical goals these providers were trying to achieve here, uh, so the first clinical goal would be emerging toxicity uh, assessment, and that would be the foremost goal, for example, in an ER uh, environment. And then there was also drug overdose assessment, patient behavior risk stratification, medication compliance monitoring, and then finally regulatory compliance for downstream clinical interventions, for example, in our um, transplant uh, service units. So as you can see here, the clinical goals of these individuals really vary a lot. And then if you ask the question whether our current clinical toxicology screening tour can, can meet these individual needs, then the answer is no. So our uh, uh, solution is try to develop something that we uh, would be able to meet, uh, with which we would be able to meet the individual needs of the, of the clinical providers. So as a clinical laboratory, and our analytical goal here have to uh, reflect what the clinical goal is. So uh, our analytical goal is to set up a comprehensive toxicology screening program to meet individual clinical needs. So here is what we have in mind and what we propose to um, 
to develop the comprehensive toxicology solution targeted to individual needs. So we divided the providers into two different categories. On the right side, you can see here is ED, and the all prime purpose is to assess the toxicity in an emerging environment for the patients who come through their doors. So uh, for this purpose, turnaround time is very important. And uh, typically, the immunoassay, even though uh, there are many limitations they may have, uh, with the quick turnaround time may still be the current best current solution for the ED purpose. And then, of course, as needed, we can always reflex the immunoassays to a more comprehensive testing uh, for the ED providers as well. And now on the left side, you can see for many other clinical providers such as oncology, neurology, critical care, transplant, and internal medicine, their needs mostly focus on overdose assessment, behavior risk stratification, and compliance monitoring. And for them, the limitation of the current immunoassays are very uh, obvious. So we propose to do a screening approach uh, using lc 10 ms back assay to cover, cover many drugs and their metabolites in one run, and therefore provide that results to these clinical uh, providers to meet their needs. So in order to develop this analytical solution, he, here are the tours and the approaches we uh, took. So basically, we want to develop lc 10 ms spec method that can simultaneously quantitate 78 drugs and metabolites in the urine at the same time. And we want to have a very simple sample preparation uh, procedure. The goal is to minimize sample preparation and with the goal, final goal to shorten turnaround time as much as we need. So we used a simple dilute and shoot approach rather than uh, a complicated uh, extraction approach. And the other approach we adopted was to incorporate the direct glucuronide conjugates quantitation into the method. So there are uh, two different ways you can uh, go here for glucuronide conjugates. One way is to undergo uh, hydrolysis and then quantify the glucuronide as part of the parent compound in the end in your method. So if you look in the literature, uh, there are different methods using either uh, acid hydrolysis and uh, or um, enzymatic hydrolysis. However, the issue here is that whether you, which approach you use, depending on which approach you use, the efficiency of hydrolysis varies from one method to the other and may vary from one compound uh, to another as well. So it's hard to optimize the hydrolysis efficiency for all the compounds, especially when you have a, a large menu here. So our approach is to go the other way and just uh, incorporate the quantitation of glucuronides directly as much as, as we can into the uh, manual itself. And this may take a little bit more effort in the beginning for method development, but it will really pay off uh, in the end, as I will um, try to show you in a few slides later in our method comparison studies. And then because uh, there is such a, a broad menu, we separated them into a positive ionization method and a negative ionization method uh, to maximize the ionization efficiency for each of the compound on the menu. So the advantage here is that we can use the same column and the same mobile phase for the two different methods. We just do simply another injection, switch to the negative ionization after the first run is done, and then uh, do another injection. Um, and then the mass spec we used was the AVSAX 5500Q trap mass spectrometer, and which was tagged to a Shimazu UHPLC instrument. The column we used was a biphenyl column and with gradient elution comprising 0.1% formic acid in water uh, being the mobile phase A and 0.1% of formic acid in methanol being mobile phase B. So if you want to see more about technical details, then I recommend you refer to our published article in Journal of Analytical Toxicology for more technical details. So um, here is our compound list. I know this is a pretty small print, and it's a long list, so I won't belabor and go through every um, item on this uh, compound list. But it suffice to say that it takes us a lot of effort to try to identify the precursor as, a, as, as well as the daughter ions for each of these compounds. And then we also um, optimized each of the DP, uh, the clustering potential and collision energy, uh, as well as the other perimeters for each of these compounds. 
So continue on the next slide is a continuation of the compound list. So I do want to mention one of the uh, compounds on our menu, which was norproxifen. So and this was a particular challenging analyte for us. Norproxifen has been reported in literature to be unstable, and it may degrade to different uh, degradation products, the major ones being MPD. And this is a cyclized, uh, cycle, cyclized uh, metabolite for norproxifen. And this uh, conversion can uh, be ongoing constantly. So this can happen in your patient sample, your uh, patient urine sample, and may also happen your analyzed in your, um, uh, ca uh, in your calibrators as well as your QCs. So this is a particular challenge, challenge because how do you know exactly um, you are accurately quantified the norproxifen concentration in your patient? sample. Uh, you, you can note also the M2Z ratio of these two compounds are quite different as well. So in our method, uh, what the solution we came up to address this challenge was to quantify norproxifen and MPD separately, and then we convert the MPD concentration mathematically back to norproxifen and sum together the total concentration. So basically, the equation we used was to quantify the peak area of MPD and then normalize that with the M to Z ratio between the two compounds, and then sum that up with the norproxifen uh, concentration with peak area we observed, and then uh, normalize that to the internal standard peak area. So this approach was able to generate a linear calibration curves for us for norproxifen. And then when we did a spiking analysis and experimentation, we found that uh, we we can get very accurate and precise validation results from this approach, uh, which indicate this is a valid method for the, um, solving the challenge of norproxifen. And then here is the internal standard pairing uh, table here. And then again, this is a long list, so I won't go through each of them. Uh, but as much as we can, we try to find a deuterated standards for each of the compound. And this may not be commercially uh, available for each compound. So uh, we try to match the compound with a chemically structured uh, similar uh, compound for internal standard. And here, the slide shows the chromatograms we generated for, on the left would be the positive ionization method, and on the right would be the negative ionization method. Uh, as you can see here, we have definitely more compounds and metabolites in the positive ionization method, and a much smaller, and therefore, a uh, much shorter runtime for our negative ionization method. And here is a table summarizing the assay uh, validation findings. Again, this is pretty small. I apologize for the small print. Uh, but basically, um, for each of the compounds, we have addressed the calibration uh, linear uh, coefficient. And then we have selected the cutoff for us to call either and this was positive or negative. And typically, the cutoff concentration would be taken from most of the mass spec cutoff concentration used for confirmation. Uh, and then, uh, well, rubber, we can find such a cutoff concentration, then we would reflect that from a uh, medically decision limit uh, standpoint. And then we also have our linear range mapped out for each of these, lower limit of detection, lower limit of quantitation, uh, and then sample stability at four degree. Uh, we typically store our samples more than a week, so we looked at at least the sample stability for at least a week and determining most of them would be pretty stable over in that time course. Uh, and then uh, we also have our um, uh, other uh, perimeters mapped out for the um, assay validation as well. So as a summary here, we have two levels of QC. We have a low-level QC, which was set at 50% of the cutoff, and we have a high-level QC, which was at three times of the cutoff concentration. And the inter and intra assay precision at two QC levels we had were less than or equal to 10% for most of the analytes. The recovery was generally pretty good, um, between 80 to 100 percent for most of the analytes, except for some of the following lists in the slides here. So typically, you can see some of them were around 60 percent, and some of them were as high as 150 percent. So we uh, hypothesized that that this was 
caused because these uh, compounds uh, did not have available due to internal standards. So they had to be matched to another chemically similar compound uh, for their quantitation, and that may cause some, uh, uh, some uh, accuracy issues in the quantitation. And then, of course, we want to confirm uh, or test the PT, proficiency testing performance of our method. So here is a, a CAB uh, DMPM proficiency testing specimens uh, comprising two different samples. And we run them through our assay and looked at our test performance. So uh, in one of the columns here, you can see our uh, lc tunnel mass spec method results. And then if you compare to the acceptable range and the mean quanti uh, quantitation, uh, mean concentration of all the quantitation methods, then you can see that our accuracy is pretty high, uh, at, uh, located at around 100% for most of the compounds, uh, very close to the mean of the different methods. So this indicates that our methods was, uh, would uh, perform successfully in a proficiency testing survey. And then uh, we also did method comparison. So to do this, we uh, randomly selected 20 different patient urine samples. And then we tested them in-house here, both using our immunoassay, which is our current clinical toxicology screening tool. And then we also ran them on our lc tunnel mass spec, which is our new method. And we also split the samples and then sent them to a reference lab uh, who was using a tough high resolution for um, screening for some of the analytes and immunoassay for other analytes. And then if it's positive, then the reference lab will reflex that to a LC tunnel mass back assay or sometimes a GC mass back assay. So we compared our testing results with the reference lab test results. In most of the cases, the correlation was pretty good, uh, with the exception of a few cases, uh, which I would like to uh, discuss a little bit further. So um, the uh, first um, uh, category of uh, method comparison results I'd like to call your, uh, call your attention to is uh, this case here. So VP3 is uh, one of the urine samples we sent out and then also did the internal correlation. In our email assay, it was uh, turned out as positive for amphetamine for uh, the Roche email assay we use. And now the mass spec uh, assay we test in house here, actually there was lorazepam glucuronide at relatively low concentration, 97 nanograms per mil. And then when we split that to the reference lab, the reference lab came out as negative for all of the compounds on our menu. And then therefore, no uh, mass spec assay for confirmation was performed. So to address the difference here, we looked at the clinical medical record of this patient. This was, a, this was from a patient from the emergency room who complained of severe insomnia lasting for a few days. So even though we did not have a comprehensive uh, list of all the medications the patient was taking uh, while he was outside of the hospital, but it could be reasonable uh, to uh, hypothesize that the patient could have taken a sedative or sleep-inducing drug for his insomnia. So for example, lorazepam would be such a uh, uh, sedative uh, compound for the patient to use, or trazodone for a sleep-inducing drug. And then if you look in the literature, then you, found, you can find that trazodone metabolite MCPP uh, was reported to have cross-reactivity with the Roche amphetamine assay. So to verify this, we spiked some MCPP into our uh, blank urine samples and then tested in our in-house Roche assay. And we did find that the assay generated some false positive amphetamine results from MCPP as long as the, the concentration was 10 micrograms per mil or a little bit higher than that. So in this case, I think the amphetamine result from our immunoassay was a false positive uh, potentially from the trazodone metabolite. And then lorazepam, of course, uh, given the uh, poor reactivity of lorazepam glucuronide in our Roche assay, we didn't expect our immunoassay was able to detect. Uh, but our LC mass spec assay, which was our new method, was able to catch this at relatively low concentration. And we suspect because the immunoassay was probably used in reference lab, and this was uh, potentially why lorazepam was also not caught in the reference lab assay. So this kind of illustrates an um, advantage of using the lc tunnel mass spec MAC assay as a uh, upfront screening tour uh, in which you can actually uh, 
decrease and avoid uh, some of the false positives and then catch some of the uh, false uh, negatives as well. Another case here uh, is a urine that was uh, positive for benzodiazepine on an immunoassay and also tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, when we re when we uh, tested the sample on L-cytokine mass spec A, mass assay, uh, the tramadone and tramadone metabolites showed up uh, at a pretty high concentration, and norfentanil also was uh, detected at a relatively low concentration. So um, this was uh, basically very similar to what was reflected back from our uh, send out reference lab uh, results, which was also positive for tramadol and tramadol metabolite. So uh, I think this, okay, in this case, the benzo and TCA would be false positive results on our immunoassay because none of the LC mass spec assay was able to detect it. Uh, and this again illustrates the potential to generate false positives using current uh, immunoassay technology. And then the um, third classes of uh, comparison cases here comprise of two different cases. So one, the first case was positive on benzo and opiates on our immunoassay. And then on the LC mass spec assay, we can, say, we can see many different kind of opiates uh, were positive. And then there are also tramadol. And then there are also uh, benzodiazepines, orchidum, uh, metabolite, uh, and aminoclonazepam as well. So this was consistent with our immunoassay results. And then when we look at the uh, reference lab results, then we see uh, the number of uh, drugs de detected was a little bit smaller. We see opiates, some of the opiates, we see some of the tramadol. Uh, but we didn't really see the benzodiazepines being detected in the reference lab result. And similarly, the second case was positive for barbiturates, uh, which was consistent with the LC mass spec in house here, uh, but none of these was detected on the reference lab uh, screening uh, assay, and therefore no uh, confirmation was performed. So in this case, our uh, in-house immunoassay was consistent with the LC tenor mass spec result we have in-house, and the um, uh, shorter list of detected uh, compounds may be in the reference lab may be caused by the limited reactivity of the amino assays or uh, the high resolution TOF assay in the screening uh, approach. And then uh, here's another class of um, comparison results. So for all three cases in this class, we detected various different compounds. And when we tested them on our LC mass spec assay, then you can see most of these uh, compounds detected were glucuronides, including opiates, and then in a few uh, cases, uh, other, compound, other glucuronide compounds as well. So, um, and then this was at pretty high concentration, actually. But then if you refer, compare that to the reference lab uh, send out test results, then you see um, they identified uh, actually a much shorter list. So this comparison indicates the advantage of directly incorporating the glucuronides into the screening methods. This can potentially enhance sensitivity and provides uh, more accuracy uh, and sensitivity in the compounds you can detect in the upfront screening approach. So to summarize a little bit of the analytical lessons we have gone through in the previous slides in, in our method development process, we adopted a simple Denute and Schutt method, and we directly quantified the glucuronides in our methods, and we separated the positive and negative ESI methods to maximize the ionization. We also found out that the THC uh, carboxylic acid and these glucuronide compounds tend to stick to container surfaces, um, and this may include both glass and plastic surfaces. And this can cause accuracy and reproducibility issues for some of the uh, validation as well as patient testing. So our solution to address this was to uh, prepare the calibrators and QCs in 50% of methanol, and this um, was able to mitigate this problem. However, the same issue prevented dilution for these analytes for even patient urine testing because then the accuracy of that dilution may uh, become uh, problematic. So this is just something that I wanted to mention here uh, in case you are doing similar troubleshooting and method development in your lab. And then we mentioned about no propoxifen to MPD quantitation challenge. So our solution, again, is to analyze both of these and then summing them up uh, and then convert them uh, into uh, normalizing uh, in terms of the mass to Z ratio. 
So again, this manual calculation was successful in generating linear calibration curves, accurate and precise validation results. And then we talked about false positive amphetamines on Roche assays with cross-reactivity to um, MCPP, the trisomy metabolite. And we'll also talk in depth about false negative benzodiazepines on the amino assays with low glucuronides cross-reactivity. And then we already talked about directly detecting and quantifying glucuronides. And the advantage of this is that we can enhance sensitivity and avoid false negatives. And another advantage which I did not mention was actually we can help identify adult rated specimens. Because if the patient uh, was submitting either a blank urine uh, spiked with parent compound or some other matrices other than urine for testing, then we would know this upfront because no glucuronide would be, able, would be seen on our LCMS spec method. And this is a particular way to um, help identify adult rated specimens. So um, once we have the analytical uh, method in place, we went ahead to uh, assess our clinical engagement. So again, uh, based on ordering physician needs, we propose we will triage the urine drug screen orders to two different uh, uh, methods here. Uh, they will be triaged to immunoassays if they are from ED for emerging toxicity assessment or for other providers while the turnaround time is a little bit, um, can be a little bit longer, then we will triage them to directly to the mass spectrometry based on screening and the quantitation for their uh, individual needs. And then after that, it's very important uh, that we provide a comprehensive report uh, for every sample we test uh, to uh, report to the clinician and then analyze and then uh, explain to the clinician what the finding was. So other than just reporting positive or negative what, what the concentration is, we know that the metabolism pathway and the many of the method is very comprehensive and may be hard for the clinician to uh, comprehend. So here is what we provide uh, interpretation, divide our finding into either a consistent with reported medication needs, uh, medication use, or inconsistent with medication use. And then under each header, we report the specific compound detected uh, and then the concentration detected as well. So this will help uh, with the clinician's interpretation. And then as needed, we can also provide phone consultation as well. So here's the graph summarizing the final solution we have, uh, uh, basically um, adapted on the previous slide I've shown here. This is a comprehensive toxicology solution targeted to different individual needs of our providers. So depending on their location, what their needs, we um, triage them to different testing, either LCMS spec or the immunoassays. And the immunoassays can be reflexed to the LCMS spec if clinically needed. And then by using this approach, we believe we added value by covering more drug in our menu. So this includes 78 drugs and our metabolites. And we also added value by increased our sensitivity and specificity of the testing. As I mentioned, we can help identify adult rated specimens. And then most importantly, I think the interpretation and consultation is very important to our clinicians to help them better understand the test results. So to uh, circle back to the first two cases and that I mentioned to you in the beginning of the presentation. So remember, case one was the patient admitted for a psychiatric treatment and had repeatedly false negative benzodiazepine testing. So uh, in, in to uh, test what this uh, case would uh, actually uh, be in our new uh, toxicology solution, we tested the patient's uh, urine on our um, lc 10 spec assay. So remember, the patient was reporting medication use, including lorazepam and garbapentin. And as expected, we were able to see both of these compounds for lorazepam mostly as the metabolite, lorazepam glucuronide, at pretty high concentration in the patient's urine. So this corroborates the patient's um, medical uh, use of lorazepam and uh, give our clinical pharmacist more assurance in our testing results. And case two uh, was a patient uh, with um, a, report, uh, a long list of reported medications and was uh, admitted to opioid detox program. And remember, we were saying that even acid results were reportedly uh, negative for oxycodone. So we then tested the patients on our LC mass spec assay. So in this assay, we can see our prozolam was positive. 
uh, which was consistent with the medication reporting use. And then there was also oxazepam pam glucuronide uh, at relatively low concentration. So this corroborates the documentation that the patient was actually using uh, multiple different benzodiazepines other than just the Xanax. <clears throat> And then benzoacnine was positive, consistent with the uh, report you use as well. Gabapentin was consistent with medication. And then, um, I'm sorry, THC, glucuronide was consistent with report you use. But benzoacnine was kind of unexpected finding because that was not on the patient's reported uh, medication use. But um, from the oxymass back assay, we can again see there was no oxycodone or any of the metabolites detected. So uh, this gives our um, clinician more assurance. Uh, indeed, the patient was not taking the prescribed oxycodone and therefore gives them more tour, more uh, confidence in confronting the patient uh, in the opioid detox program. So uh, to summarize here, um, we uh, have shown, uh, shown that the traditional UDS cannot meet the various individual needs of the clinical providers. And here we have set up a comprehensive toxicology screening solution to utilize triple quadruple lc 10 mass spec to include screening and quantitation of 78 drugs and metabolites. And this approach has analytical advantage over simply using immunoassay for screening or a high resolution mass spec for screening, which hopefully have convinced you in now in, in our uh, method comparison uh, examples. And clinically, this solution adds value to providers by providing a more comprehensive manual coverage, potential detection of adult rated specimens, increasing sensitivity and specificity, and results interpretation and consultation. And all of these uh, can strengthen the role of laboratorians in uh, proactively contributing to the patient care. So with that, um, I thank you for your attention, and I would like to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And the first question is, do you see positive propoxyphen samples? I understand that it has not been available in the US uh, for several years. Um, so yeah, uh, the answer is we do see very few propoxyphen positive samples. But again, that depends on probably the geographic area. Um, in our uh, location, we see uh, really uh, the uh, propoxyphen uh, positive samples, but uh, definitely one to two from time to time still. Could you talk more about what is special for the seven drugs that were chosen to develop for toxicology tests by Roche and other vendors um, in tradition? Sure, so from my understanding, the seven drugs uh, or sometimes depending on the platform you use, maybe you know eight or nine different drugs. Uh, may be chosen by different vendors because of historically they have been shown to have high potential uh, abuse uh, use. And then from uh, epidemiology studies, uh, it has been shown that uh, there are a lot of abuse for this particular compound as well. But then again, the manual has not been changed for many years. Uh, and then gradually there has been addition to the manual as well. For example, methadone metabolite, which used not to be available on these um, clinical toxicology screening, uh, gradually became available and has been incorporated onto some of the testing platforms. 
Uh, and then same thing would be six um, mam, which is a metabolite for uh, heroin use, for example. But then again, with the um, ever-changing landscape of clinical toxicology and medical toxicology, um, the you know the manual change still can catch up with the current uh, landscape change in real practice. So this is still a significant problem that the manual is not able to cover the um, current needs clinically. How do you determine the turnaround time? And can you decrease it further to meet the physician's ideal request? So yeah, that is a very interesting question. So um, from the clinician standpoint, their request is usually to have a test result turned back to them as fast as possible, ideally in minutes. That would be great. But then I think from the laboratory's uh, perspective, uh, we not only want to turn out the turnaround time very rapidly, but also want to make sure the results we turn back to them is valid, is accurate, and specific. Uh, and that's why in particular situations like this, you have to balance the two different needs. So in the um, context of LC10 mass spec, uh, mass spec testing, uh, you you can it, it's very challenging for you to achieve a turnaround time as fast as you are screening. I would say probably it's not possible uh, ever because you know again even with a minimum of sample preparation you still have to undergo the um, uh, the um, analysis uh, process which is typically much longer than a typical immunoassay and this is not remember a automated high throughput platform this is a pretty manual assay. So I think with a two days typically turnaround time, this is probably uh, uh, already a very good turnaround time for the clinicians. So I don't think we can ever achieve like 45 minutes turnaround time uh, to give them the results. That would be stretching, I think, the analytical goals here. What about lithium toxicity screening? How long would it take for the physicians to be informed in order to prescribe the right dose of the medication? So uh, lithium is actually not included in any of the either I mean, uh, the clinical toxicology screening or the mass spec, but it, it is available as a standalone uh, different immunoassay. So, um, you can monitor the uh, lithium as part of the therapeutic drug monitoring uh, testing you offer in a clinical lab, and that typically would give the clinicians a rapid turnaround time and give them an idea how to titrate their doses. Sorry, let me turn on the office lights here. What are the steps involved in sample prep hydrolysis, and what does each step accomplish? Okay, let me, let me repeat that question. What are the steps involved in sample prep hydrolysis, and what does each step accomplish? Sure. So uh, the basic steps for sample preparation for, um, a, for example, a clinical toxicology mass spec testing would be typically to first to precipitate out the protein in the urine matrix, and then secondly to uh, either use acid or enzyme to hydrolyze the glucuronide conjugates from uh, uh, different metabolites. So the goal is to uh, get rid of the glucuronides, which is a typical moiety in the metabolites of different compounds, and then quantify these compounds together uh, as they are parent, parent drug in the compound. So that's the goal, is to uh, achieve the quantitation as a single compound. But as I mentioned before, this uh, may not be very efficient for all the compounds, and hydrolysis efficiency really vary from one method to the other and from one compound to another. So to us, the best approach was just to avoid that variability and de directly detect the glucuronide compounds in our method. So I hope that makes sense. We have time for one last question. How is the lower limit of detection decided? So, 
So uh, the lower limit of detection was decided uh, usually by running a blank urine sample, in this case, on our LC tunnel mass spec assay, and then uh, quantify the uh, potential uh, mean and uh, a standard deviation from that blank urine sample. And then the lower limit of, of detec detection usually is determined by the mean of that blank sample plus free standard deviation. So this indicates that uh, for a blank sample to come through, here is your lower limit of detection uh, to say that um, if it's not a blank sample, and this is the lower limit I can detect. But again, uh, usually that's not the same as a lower limit of quantitation. So lower limit of quantitation, which is another term, is usually determined by where the assay can attain about 20% uh, CV. Uh, coefficient of variation, and then we typically use the lower limit of quantitation as the lower end of our reporting and calibration curve. All right, I think that's all for my answer. I would like to once again thank Dr. Wong for her presentation. Do you have any final comments, Dr. Wong? Well, at this point, I just want to thank everybody who have uh, logged in to view the presentation, and I hope you uh, take home something useful from the presentation. And I would like to thank Labrus for organizing this event so that I, I am able to share my experience uh, with the audience. And if you have any questions in the future, just feel free to contact me uh, by email or by phone. You should be able to find my contact information uh, on Methodist uh, website. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wang. This presentation has been approved for continuing educational credits. If you want to obtain the credits, please click on the Get Your Free CE Credits button located in the lower left of your screen. This will take you to a page listing all of our speakers and presentations. Please click, please select the CE button under the presentation and follow the instructions to claim your certificate. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 11th, 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>